class. There are eight students here. They've had one semester of basic computer programming, and when they heard you were coming, they thought since you were coming to school, you better take a quiz. So one of the programs that they've written is a quiz program for you. The other is a, a series of screens that will appear simultaneously. So as I take you to the computer area, if you would uh, just look from left to right at the screens, you'll see a little message. And I want you to have a copy of the, one of the programs here. It's the quiz program. Uh, you'll find out when you take the quiz that the questions are not difficult. Um, however, we hope that you'll appreciate the real technical that went into writing the program. And they would like to have this copy. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. I can't keep it to the table. <laughs> you want to follow me into the computer area? Right. And you have your own computer over here for the day. You know, and I have to say about the quizzes and so forth, you know, I heard about the student who went back to his old school and uh, they were taking an economics test. And he looked and he said to the professor, he said, you're using the same questions that you used when I was here. And he said, yes, but he said, the answers are different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you want to follow me in? Question to the mic, please. You might want to stand back here so you can get the vision of the screens. Well, thank you very much. Okay, <laughs> there's more to come here. <laughs> and industries have been very good to us in, in helping us to acquire the computer hardware that we need and we'll just be confident that in the future they'll continue to see that as an integral need in education. I came back to see the progress that has taken place and what it was accomplishing uh, here and has taken an interest in it. And they're going to make it possible to expand it, the opportunities that are available for young people. This is a most remarkable school. And uh, we've talked about it often in Washington since our visit here. Mr. President, can we? Uh, I understand that uh, probably a large part of that was due to uh, shrinking inventory. You got to meet the rest of the well, students? Well, yes. Right. Yeah. 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 Y
President, we're very honored to have you welcome you back to Providence St. Paul. When you came here eight months ago, you were an interested visitor, so you come as a good friend. As you've seen this afternoon, much has happened since your last visit. With the help of individuals and corporations, we have acquired some new computers to help our students go into the world fully equipped to handle the high technology needs of today. Compulsory training in computers is just one example of Providence St. Mel's commitment to excellence. That commitment has been very rewarding. This year, 100% of last year's graduating class went on to college. But as you know, Mr. President, certainly am impressed with what you're doing. And uh, again, as you acknowledged over here when I left after that one visit a year ago, I made a phone call and uh, told Ken Stone what I had just seen and experienced here. God bless him. He, he was immediately involved. Our uh, first stop here, as you know, was and as you mentioned, was in the computer room, and Sister Janie and the students demonstrated what they're learning in that advanced computer class. And, uh, you know, from time to time I talk about the importance of training for people that are seeking work. And something only it takes, a, it just takes a magic wand, but nearly a fourth of our unemployed never had a job or are just entering the job market for the first time. Many are willing to work, but they lack the skills in a fast-changing economy that is geared more and more to computers. And uh, retraining for the day of today's workforce for tomorrow's world is a great challenge and a great opportunity. Uh, here in Providence St. Mel, you're providing a lesson in leadership. And, uh, I understand 44% of your recent graduates indicated that they intend to pursue a science-related career. I annoy some of the people around me by, on Sundays, getting a hold of Metropolitan papers and looking at not one of those. <laughs> and uh, there are scads of pages of them, but it's very significant, and I've been impressed that lately, uh, they're not just ads of employers looking for someone to come to a job, but they're literally ads that are begging and advertising for people with science in the fields of science and uh, electronics and engineering and so forth. And it reveals that with all of our great unemployment that we want to solve, there are jobs out there that are going unfilled simply because people haven't been trained to, to fill them. 
but uh, you're making uh, the meeting that need, I should say, with the, this computer class and making it mandatory for graduation. Uh, I remember back when a year of Latin was mandatory. <laughs> 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 I had trouble with that. I think I had more trouble with the computer. <laughs> But just as schools must meet the change for the future, so must government, business, and labor work hand in hand to help in this effort. And I, I mentioned the Board of Governors. Governors has been established, uh, has, has, has been mentioned, I should say, to spearhead a campaign, and I understand for six and a million, it's a six and a half million dollar campaign. Finance scholarship, meet operating needs, and to buy needed equipment. Well, this will help Providence St. Mel to hear to what lies ahead. And I'm delighted that you've asked me to be the honorary national chairman of this drive. And I'm honored. That's the way I feel. And uh, I was going to say here, and you did it for me. I was going to say, I accept. <laughs> Uh, you know, many computers are now being used in schools and they're made available and donated by private firms. Business knows, I think, it's in their interest to have young people who are trained for tomorrow's tasks. As a matter of fact, I'm asking businesses across the country to meet these challenges. I've been told that the school is and you told it here again that the school is known as a hard work high school. I've heard that already clear back in Washington. And uh, I've seen it proven today. It really is. Paul Tennyson said, I dipped into the future as far as the human eye could see, saw a vision of the world, and all the wonder that would be. Well, Providence St. Mel has looked into the future and seen what a wonder it is. And the biggest reason that you're sitting right here is you're not afraid to, to dream, to get involved, and to care. So let us pray that Providence St. Mel will be a shining example of schools all across this country. The future isn't something to fear. And today's problems can be tomorrow's victories. And they're working together there isn't anything that we can't do. So to all of you and to all of those young people that I know are in another room hearing this, I thank you all and God bless you all. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we'd like to discuss now as, as, a, as a group what this is. Millions of Americans, not only adults, but young people, who are in this great movement of self-help since your inaugural address, that uh, you are the government, and therefore you should learn how to help yourself and share with others. Fantastic things have happened and specifically under the concepts we call the art of motivation with PMA and something more. Are sharing with them your concepts that any government that's been had of those uh, citizens of these countries with whom I and others have worked in behalf of uh, all of us in America who uh, are following your inspiration of self-help, I want to thank you. Los Angeles University of California. I would like to make a suggestion to Mr. James D. Hattie that here at Providence St. Mary we require more math, three years of math and three years of science since this school is college prep. So that when we, um, any board member would like to make a comment? Yes, I, I'm so excited about the dynamic leadership that is exemplified in our principal, Paul Adams. And the 
really primary example of breaking the cycle of poverty that he has developed here at Providence <coughs> St. Mel. That I, I wish, Mr. President, that we could find a way of, of taking it across the country. All the, all the technical training in the world doesn't do any good if the <coughs> other parts of a well-rounded education aren't taken into account. And the discipline and drive and high moral standards that Principal Adams has set up in this school are what go are what make the total student and what is responsible, in my opinion, for making these students such exciting examples of what our American youth can be. And there's one word in his vocabulary that's never been a part of his vocabulary, and I almost want to whisper it so he can't hear it. He never learns about permissiveness. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps one of the young ladies who are students at Providence saying, I would like to make a comment. <coughs> because of your, your principle here, um, we heard in Washington, uh, heard about this school and what had happened and almost happened, that it almost was to be closed down, and then heard what one man who surrounded himself then with others who felt as strongly as he did in the teaching line and so forth, uh, what he was doing here, literally hanging on my fingernails to keep this school open. And uh, I wanted to see it. And came here and visited and saw that everything I'd heard was true. Met the students, had a question and answer session with them, and was even further impressed. And that's when I went out of here and <laughs> called Clem Stone and said, uh, something like this has got to be continued. Nothing must happen to this, and uh, come back here now. And you can feel it before you get in the building. Almost the the vibrancy of what's taking place. But it, uh, you know, it's uh, you lit a candle. And we saw it all the way in Washington. <laughs> yeah. We have time for one more comment. Bob, would you like to? be here and to help in this great cause. Uh, this is a demonstration of some things that I think are near and dear to your heart, like private initiative, private enterprise, and creativity. And uh, it has taken a mixture of that across the Chicago community to make this success story. I had just one other thing that will strike home to you. I grew up in a small town in North Missouri by the name of Reagan. and. Uh, uh, town about two years before we found out he was doing it off of a ticker tape. <laughs> I thought he was in Wrigley Field here in Chicago. Uh, <laughs> now that's great. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> in the days, the team didn't have its own announcer. <laughs> uh, so we, there were six or seven of us doing the same game, and you had to kind of compete for the audience, and some of our competitors were actually at the ballpark, and I was waiting to get it off, as you say, a telegram. And uh, then you do the, the home games of both teams. When the Cubs left town, you stayed and, and did the, the Cubs the White Sox games. It was a depression. <laughs> and uh, we did all of that, but it was just a, uh, you know, I get something that said S1C, and you can't sell very many <coughs> Wheaties if you just excitedly yell S1C. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say, Dean comes out of the windup. Here comes the pitch, and it's a call strike, breaking over the outside corner to a batter that likes the ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a story that I told at times, maybe I shouldn't take the time to tell it here, but one day, <laughs> on the other side of the, when it wasn't a ticker tape, it actually was, he had headphones and he would get the Morse code and tap it out, and a slip would come under a little slit in the window for me. And I saw him start to type, so I started another ball on the way to the plate, and he was shaking his head. <laughs> <laughs> the Cubs and Cardinals, and I didn't know what. It, and when I got it, he said the wire's gone dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, those other six or seven fellows out there broadcasting, I knew that if I said we will pause for a brief interlude to transcribe music, 
until they get the wire fixed, everybody just switched stations and I wouldn't have any audience there. So I thought there's one thing that doesn't get the floor book. And Billy Jurgis was at the plate, and I had him follow one off. <laughs> I looked at Curly on the other side of the window there, and he was just, he was helpless, and so I...